Greeting guys, John here, and I'm here with another video, and this one is going to be not talking about cultural things or politics or anything like that. I want to kind of avoid that as much as possible and only talk on it when feel necessary. But in this video, it's going to be the first part in a series of videos where I'm going to go through my illustration process. And this video is kind of like an introduction. Um, and I say my illustration process, this process is heavily influenced by uh, famous popular artists that uh, are no longer with us anymore. But I think it's important to look towards those masters that are remembered and to learn from them. Either, I mean, part, part of that is through master studies, but another part is to study their process, listen to what they said and how they made images and constructed images, or just looking at how they did it. And what can we learn from that? And so this is kind of just, again, like an intro into it. And uh, for this first one, I'm going to look at a couple different artists, in particular three artists that I particularly like, which is Frank Frazetta, of course. I love Frank Frazetta's work. Uh, Norman Rockwell and Maxfield Parrish. And uh, these are artists I highly suggest you look up. Obviously, everyone knows Norman, Norman Rockwell. You, you're probably familiar. If you don't know Frank Frazetta's name, you've seen his art. And Maxfield Parrish is a little more unknown of an artist to maybe the those that are not interested in art history, but is still an important artist, I think, to look into and to study and learn from. So, before we even get into painting anything or sketching thumbnails or anything like that, I want to talk about the design process. And for me, almost thinking how concept art and illustration kind of overlap. I have definitely kind of drifted more towards illustration than I have towards concept art. I'm not really that interested in being a concept artist anymore. Uh, that just doesn't uh, interest me as much. And I've had a lot of fun over the last few years doing freelance work for companies like Chaosium and doing Call of Cthulhu, um, Green Ronin, uh, doing The Expanse, uh, Mongoose Publishing, doing Traveler, some Kickstarter projects like uh, Game uh, Immortals, which was like a board game, card game, strategy sort of game. Uh, stuff like that. Like, that stuff interests me. That stuff really gets me excited about it. Not so much as concept art. But I think within the process of illustrating, there is the idea of conceptualizing as well. And so I want to talk about that. I want to talk about how to create a a polished, finished, well-done illustration. It's something, and I'm not saying that I'm good at this. I'm not. Part, part of my uh, reason for making this video is, is selfish in that I want to improve my, myself, and so it's, it's sort of me cataloging and researching for myself and benefiting all of you in the process as well that are watching um, the, the process of these masters, and then kind of, you're going to see me experiment and fail more than likely, uh, but then hopefully succeed in the end with a completed illustration. So again, for this first video, we're going to talk about, we're not going to even draw anything, we're just going to talk about the process that a lot of artists in the past have employed, and how we can learn from those ourselves and become better artists and construct better images and illustrations. So the first one I want to talk about is Frank Rosetta, and I want to read something, um, I'll link to it here in um uh the the uh video description and it's from a a blog here and it, it says uh i'm gonna read two paragraphs from it because it's just really interesting to me and this is in regards to frank frazetta's approach to creating art frazetta's approach to creating art whether it is oil ink or watercolor is classical and traditional. There are no secret potions, paints, or exotic instruments responsible for Frazetta's magic. He begins with an idea. Consider his approach in creating a painting. For many years, Frank would start the creative process by taking a hot cup of coffee, a pencil, and a sketchbook, and sit down on a faux zebra skin sofa next to a small light. He used a simple number two pencil that has been sharpened with a knife. The crude sharpening provides Frank with an abundance of angles on the pencil top. Each area provides Frazetta with a different visual effect. He prefers to work in the late night with a little classical music providing a pleasant background. 
After a bit of thought and a few sips of coffee, a small pencil drawing is drawn in the modest sketchbook. Rosetta has a powerful visual, visual imagination. He's able to see his idea and transform it in his mind's eye until he sees the correct result. After mentally twisting it and turning it and considering all the possible angles of action and impact, he then puts it down on paper. The idea is drawn quickly and decisively. The essence is all there, if appropriate. Rosetta adds a bit of watercolor to his sketch to give it a full form and to observe the effects of light. Often, this coloring process is unnecessary and Frazetta moves directly to the easel, relying on his intuitive sense of color correctness. This is really the sacred moment of inspiration and execution, the essence of creative intuition. Frazetta holds before him, in miniature, the first fruit of creative imagination, a direct flow from the inner soul of a great artist. And then this person goes on to say, In a recent conversation, I asked Frazetta to comment on these studies, or comps as he likes to call them and explain some of his watercolor roughs, why some of his watercolor roughs are highly polished, uh, and why some are very loosely finished and seemingly incomplete. Frank replied, That's a tough question to answer. Sometimes I would sit down and just draw for the joy of drawing. I love the pencil. It's easy to use the mistakes. It's easy to use and mistakes are easily erased. Everything starts off as a pencil. If I like it, then I add a little color just to show where the basic lighting should be. Sometimes I get carried away and just have fun with the drawing. I try not to put everything into the rough. I want to leave something for the actual painting. My original study for the first Conan oil was a very simple pencil thumbnail, no color at all. Once I have the idea, I can sit down at, at, at the easel and bring it to life. A lot of guys like to use the camera and shoot reference shots. It takes days to get a project going. That's just not much, that's just too much work. Why bother? My friend Roy Krenkel, who was amazed at my speed, Roy would spend days and days studies, doing studies from every angle, trying to find the right concept. He studied everybody, and he copied everybody. He, con he was constantly sketching. He just didn't have enough confidence. He wasted all his energy on the studies and had nothing left for the paintings. That's when he came to me to help him finish many pieces. Getting back to your question again, the comps never meant that much to me, although there are several that I treasured. There are some comps that are as good as the paintings. Ellie sold some really great ones to fans over the years. I didn't care. I had the oil. I was much more concerned with the final result. Often I left the rough in a very loose state simply because I was out of time and a deadline was near. I didn't have any time to spend polishing the comp. The job had to get done. So let's talk about some of this here. I think, I think talking about some of this could be really interesting. And, and here, I mean, if you haven't figured it out, these are some of uh, Frank Rosetta's comps here uh, of various paintings and whatnot. And they're really cool. You can see they're they're beautiful. They're they these two at least are finished ones in their own right. And I purposely picked them that way because I really like them. But I mean, these these could be put in a book. These could be put uh, on a comic book cover or a book cover. Like, these ones are fantastic. But let's talk about some of these things here. And I want to decide, I want to I wanna highlight a couple different things. And first of all, it's tools and process. What tool are you using? Are you a digital artist like me? What brushes do you like to use? Make sure you know what kind of brushes you like to sketch things out in. In Clip Studio Paint, I really like the default real pencil brush, although sometimes I use the uh, uh, design pencil brush, which is a default brush as well. And I also have uh, some custom brushes that I downloaded and have made myself, some sketch brushes that I like as well. But it, it's kind of like the same, same deal. You have a tool, he has a pencil for the beginnings of his work where he can twist it, get different angles on the pencil and achieve different effects. Um, and he, he just kind of draws, he draws from imagination, but Frazetta also used a lot of photo reference as well. You can find lots of photos that he took of himself, his wife, friends, all these sorts of, of people that w would be willing to pose for him. And I, I, to me, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not an expert on Frazetta and it's processed per se, and his reasons for exactly doing what he did. But 
my guess would be that he took photos when he felt like he needed to do something that he needed to look at something that he didn't understand. Like, is there a foreshortened perspective? Is there a weapon? Is there a pose? I've never done this pose. I've never looked at the body from this angle before. Uh, I need to, or I haven't looked at it as much as others. And so I need to reevaluate and study this or have reference. And that's fine. Um, but I think having tools and uh, a clear path in your process is important. So, uh, do you have an intuitive sense of color like Frazetta? Probably not. I don't. Um, unless you're really good. And, and if you're really good, why are you watching this video? Go, go paint. Go make your own video so I can watch it. Because I want to learn. So for me, I, I like his idea of flushing out light and color in a thumbnail. And that's one thing I learned in art school that I thought was very valuable. And I'm just lazy. I'm lazy like Frank is here, where he says, that's too much work. And uh, you end up, I think the thing I learned in art school that I appreciated, but they kind of hammered it home to the point where I think they fall into the trap here that Frazetta mentions, is that you don't become as confident and uh, you lose sight of, of the, you lose the energy because you, you pour out all of your energy into thumbnails and color comps and you don't have anything left for the final image. You're just totally burnt out. You've lost the enthusiasm and excitement through thumbnailing and overdrawing and over planning aspects of the painting. Planning is important. Uh, making decisions early on in your thumbnailing and colors and all that sort of stuff is incredibly important. But you could do too much of it. Like, I remember taking a class and we had to do like a hundred thumbnails. And I remember it was like, at that point, a hundred thumbnails of that subject, like, and I know there's artists out there that do do, like, hundreds of thumbnails for an illustration. Good on them. I can't do that. Because I remember I didn't get a good, as good of a grade on that assignment as I had had on others, because by the time I, I got to, like, I think the 50th thumbnail, so I was, like, halfway through, I was already done. I had no energy left to, um, to to finish the, the, the assignment. I, so the last 50 were, were just me just trying to make the quota of doing 100 thumbnails rather than um, actually exploring new ideas. And so then I've burned myself out on just thumbnailing. I hadn't even gotten to color comps yet. I hadn't even thought, gotten to the point where like, how do I want to color this image? And so... I think I just arbitrarily picked colors. I wasn't happy with them, but I just wanted to, the rest of the process to be done. Um, and I think I had to do like a lot of color comps too. I think I had to do like 50 color comps or 30 color comps or something like that before I could finally get to the final illustration. And it was a relief getting to the final illustration, but I was completely burnt out. And I think that's what Frank is saying here when he says... Um, um, that's too much that's just too much work why bother uh he says here about his friend roy roy would spend days and days doing studies from every angle trying to find the right concept he studied everybody and copied everybody he was constantly sketching he just didn't have enough confidence and then here he wasted all his energy on the studies and had nothing left for the paintings and that's that's how i felt at that point uh, that's how I felt. I had no energy left for the final painting. And that's what you're returning, like, as a freelancer, that's what you're turning into the client. And honestly, like, your client doesn't generally need to see 50 million. They don't need to see 100 thumbnails. You're going to overload your client with 100 thumbnails. Like, to me, in that class, I appreciate the, the, str the stress, stressing of planning an illustration out. But that's just not practical advice to make us do 100 thumbnails. Um, you're, uh, what I recently did a, a, a job for Mongoose Publishing for Traveler for a new book that they're going to be doing. And it was some weapon designs and some firearm and uh, melee weapons, weapon designs for a new book. And uh, I remember looking at these things and like, okay, I'm going to I'm going to thumbnail some of these guns out for, for the art director. And I'm th I, and I did three thumbnails per gun. And I think it was like 20 different guns. So that's a lot of thumbnails. But it broke it up because it was um, 
three for many different types of gun per, per gun and there was different types of revolvers pistols rifles sniper rifles shotguns so there was variety there i didn't burn myself out like i knew that these three ideas like oh this gun needs to be a, a bullpup configuration traditional rifle configuration this is like a, a traditional uh like pistol grip military style rifle this one is a traditional like non-pistol grip just like a rifle buttstock sort of design and so i just sent three Ill, three thumbnails to the art director and that was enough and oftentimes those three were enough to be like oh this is great you know take thumbnail one and take the the barrel shroud of thumbnail one and mix it with the receiver of thumbnail three and i like the pistol grip in thumbnail two put those together easy that that's easy for me to do so thumbnailing is important don't need to do a million different thumbnails and i think frazetta has the right idea of going in and planning an illustration out but uh not overdoing it because you can do way too much in that uh in that initial phase of planning things out and it's sometimes the, the fun part can wear out really quick in the thumbnail. Like I like thumbnailing more often than not and discovering ideas and watching my ideas kind of grow. So like the first thumbnail is usually garbage and then they start getting progressively better. And then I start noticing, I, I stop thumbnailing when I notice that the quality of the composition is going back down again to like the first thumbnail where it's not as good. So there's like a, a, a peak up and then back down and understanding that like don't just keep drawing as soon as you start seeing that decline in quality stop like you're not going to get anything better than what you had at that peak stop the collection of bills the thumbnails that you have at that point is probably enough at that point to uh make for a good a good pool of ideas to draw from so um Yeah, let's talk about uh, other artists here. Let's see here. Let's talk about Norman Rockwell here. So Norman Rockwell used a lot of photographic reference here too, and I think that's an important part of the illustration process. So you have an idea, and um, you can see here uh, the image on the, the top here, where there's the black and white photo and then the illustration. I think that's the final one. You can see down below here, there's the final one on the left and the uh, a, a sort of color study, which is very high quality. It's better than a lot of my final illustrations that I do. Uh, and you can see like the, the one on the, the right here, on the bottom right, is more like a direct copy of the original photograph. Um, it's the background is, is dark like the original photograph the kids hands are the same but then norman rockwell decided you know i need to change some things i think the contrast um around the kid maybe needs to change so we need to get rid of this dark background and make it a light background let's uh let's simplify the background a little bit so it's focused on the the characters because just copying my reference image that i took one for one like the original on the bottom right while it looks fantastic it's a little more cluttered it's a little more busy so he he made i think the proper decision in the second phase of editing some things out removing the hat on the on the uh uh the server behind the counter simplifying the background changing the kids hands and he added like a uh uh coat into the kids hands he he makes a kid look a little more innocent like he's sitting there playing with his hands a little bit these are all like subtle little things that he's doing in this image here to uh come to that final illustration and i i want to emphasize in this part that like photo so frazetta seems here to say like he didn't always use photo reference i don't always use photo reference myself and i regret it every time i'm not frank frazetta i don't have that imagination to uh just pull things out of my head i don't have that like encyclopedia of design language in my head of how i want things to look so i often use photo uh, reference if it, if it's good enough for norman rockwell it's good enough for me is my view there's nothing 
wrong with that. And I think people that tell you like, don't use photo reference, like they need to be quiet. Um, they, they need to keep their mouths shut because it's, it's a legit way to do it. And maybe they don't need it and that's fine. But telling other people that they shouldn't use photo reference, I've, I've seen bad art tips like that before. And I, I think that that's a, uh, give it a shot. Maybe sure. Give it a shot. You can learn something, uh, that way, but don't take that as well. I can't use photo reference. No, you totally can. Here's this one here too. You can see, uh, again, how he edits some things. He adds more story to the image. So he took his photo reference here. Uh, he edits the background, simplifies it, gets rid of the character in the, the, it looks like a woman in a dress in the mirror there, adds the dolly, adds some more little toys at the girl's feet. And I mean, he, he keeps the girl almost like exactly the same. Uh, the hairstyle is the same. The facial features are very close. Like it's, it's that girl. Uh, but he, the chair, if you look at the chair, the chair is, uh, uh, the ex like right here behind the mirror with the mirrors leaning against the chair there that's exactly the same my head's in the way but the the uh stool she's sitting on is the same so like he's copying a lot of things one for one but he's editing at the same time um i i and i think that's just com that comes with practice you know taking uh taking your own photo reference looking at it and what is the essence of the story that I'm trying to tell in this image. And so what can I edit out? What's like extraneous information in the image that I don't need uh, or compositional issues like the darker background, getting rid of that white wall and um, making the background darker just makes for a more dynamic and contrasted image and makes it like more visually interesting to look at rather than, I mean, if you had copied the image as is, um, it would have been it would have been fine it would have looked great you know but he made appropriate edits um as an artist you know there are cameras like he took a picture there are cameras you can take that can capture a scene as is and there's no need for you to redraw it one for one every single time every aspect of the photograph into the new image that you're painting if, if, if a camera can just do it itself. At least that's my view. I think as an artist, and we're using photo reference, we have the ability to make edits. We have the ability to um, uh, make choices like what Rockwell's making here. You can also notice he shorted, shortened the mirror a little bit. The mirror is not as tall as uh, um, in the reference photo as it is. The image in the painting is not as tall as the, the one in the reference photo. So again here, um, he kind of added some objects in the background, added a character on the side, but you can see like the hands are changed here a little bit, like the, the boy's hands, he's holding her dress. Um, I think her gloves or something in his hand. Uh, it's the, the pose of the, the clerk behind the counter is a little different. It's a little more, uh, silly and dynamic and everything. So I just think these are great examples of how to use photos as reference. They provide like great lighting reference in these photos, you know, but um, don't, but, but coming up with your own scene, your own story, your own edits in them as well is important. And here's another one here. So it's just kind of a funny one. Um, but you can see how like there was these books here he's using to help the guy stand there so he gets like the walking motion uh so he can look like he's in movement and then he obviously edits those books out in order to uh in, in order to have his painting look like the guy is in motion as he's uh, carrying this frame out here and obviously the frame is is totally different the guy in the painting looks a little shorter a little, a little stockier uh even a little heavier he, he exaggerates a lot of features about this guy so this is Maxfield Parrish. Now, he takes a different approach. Um, he would make these 3D, like, uh, scenes. He'd, he'd make dioramas, and he'd take photos of them or have them set up next to his easel, and he would paint and use these as reference. And this is really cool. This is almost like the proto 
kind of what a lot of artists and myself included do today where you build a scene in 3d as either reference or to paint directly over the top of it and so i i, I think that's really cool and uh maxfield Parrish's work kind of exemplifies that idea because he's getting solid solid fo uh, reference here w whether he's using the photo as reference or he's has the the diorama set up in the room with him all lit up and uh is is working directly from looking at the uh the diorama and i think there's one more here so you can see he took a photo reference of this young woman and uh you can see how he edits the he didn't have the exact costume that's one one fun thing you can do uh is he didn't have the exact costume uh he had enough of it like the the sleeves there don't connect to the the models uh it, it looks like a more ragtag shirt than what the image in the painting is and i think that's a it's a cool thing to take note of as well and I want to talk about a video that I made if you're interested in kind of more of using photo references and photo bashing. I did a photo bashing a character design in Clip Studio Paint, which has a lot of good fundamental principles and sort of things you can look at if you plan on going kind of like that Maxfield Parrish modern approach in using photos as reference or as uh, directly in your, your image like I did here. So uh, I took the image of myself on the on the right, on the left, I'm sorry. Uh, in my garage and used that went into clip studio paint added different elements painted over the top and got the image on the right so I just want to emphasize in this video before we we get into drawing in the next video we actually get into drawing in the next video that planning is important like every time every time I've done a painting or a drawing and I never planned it out like there's some joy in discovering a painting as you go and sometimes you get really awesome results but for me since i don't know that much and i'm still learning and i'm sure you're still learning too if you're watching this video again if you're not still learning why are you watching my video teach me uh i'm still learning so like i don't have like the design sense of a, of a frank frazetta i don't have the design sense of, of an artist that can just like visualize the painting in my head and just bring it out into into the canvas just effortlessly i always make mistakes or what i envisioned in my head i i lay it out on the canvas and it's just my lack of abilities or uh, my vision just wasn't well thought out but that said too i think drawing in your head is important as well i think kim kim jungus uh I probably butchered his name um but he he talks about that like he was in the military for korean military for a long time and uh he couldn't be draw a lot of the time so he would just draw in his head and i think that while not the same as drawing in real life it's better than nothing so there is an aspect of thinking about an image and frank rosetta pointed this out in in his process here you know he'd sip on some coffee and before he even started drawing would would think about an image the point of my rambling right now is that planning out an image is important and i think oftentimes um like it happened with my paul atreides paul muadib on the throne painting where i i kind of didn't thumbnail as much as i should have and the image just didn't turn out quite like i wanted or the the worms to shia halud illustration dune fan art i did as well uh that one um could have turned out a lot better if i had done more thumbnailing i don't think i did any thumbnailing i sort of did in posing it in blender and moving the camera around but i should have taken more time to oh, excuse me bored myself with all my rambling i should have taken more time to um plan that image out as well and so that's kind of why i wanted to do this series of videos again more for myself than th than anything else and anyone else can benefit from me sort of essentially journaling uh, my view and, and my my journey as i as i attempt to do an illustration with a a, a less amorphous 
process than I normally have. I'm trying to do a more rigid, disciplined process with this than I normally do. Um, usually, when I have a disciplined process for an image, it comes out better. I just, it just always does. So that's going to do it for this video, guys. Uh, you can support me on Subscribestar. Links will be in the video description below. It's uh, subscribestar.com forward slash LibreArt, um, Libre hyphen art. Um, Libre -art. Uh, you can also find me on Coffee ko or Ko-Fi, uh, and you can like and subscribe to this video. It helps me out. Help me get my uh, YouTube views up. Um, I got enough subscribers to become a YouTube partner, but I don't have the, the view hours yet, so I need to get that up. So please, like, subscribe, share. It means a lot to me. I'll catch you guys in the next video. Uh, that one will actually start planning an idea of a painting out with thumbnail, do some color comps maybe, and uh, start that first process in Clip Studio Paint. So until then, I'll catch you guys in the next video. Keep drawing, keep painting, keep practicing. And I'll see you guys next time.